Okay, so we're going to start our next unit, which is electricity and magnetism. This unit, we're going to talk about electricity and what it is. And then a little bit about magnetism. We'll talk about circuits as well. This first week, though, we're going to mostly focus on charge and the nature of charge. So charge is like protons, electrons, neutrons, those things. This is the most fundamental concept in electromagnetism that you need to understand. So let's get started. So what is electrical charge? Well, electrical charge occurs when an object attracts or repels other objects due to an electric field. Charges can be either positive or negative. Protons are positive charges. Electrons are negative char charges. And charge has a unit of coulombs. So coulombs we, we use capital C, that is the unit of charge. So for example, you might see, if I tell you this was four coulombs and this was negative four coulombs, for example. Coulombs is the unit of charge. And like always, we have the same magnitude. So, charge interactions. So, remember that a force, as we define in our forces in motion units, is a push or a pull. So, an electrical force is the force that attracts or repels charges. So, repel means to push things away. Attract means to pull things closer. So once again, repel is to push things away. Attract is to pull things closer. So like charges, for example, two protons and two electrons repel each other. So two protons will push each other away. Two electrons will push each other away, as you can see here on the side. But then when you have a positive charge and a negative charge, they actually attract. They want to be closer to each other, so they move closer to each other. So just like we did in um, our last semester, our last unit, um, when two charges interact, they apply, apply the same force on each other. Newton's third law still applies. Remember that Newton's third law says that equal opposite forces. So keep in mind when we remember... Oh. Newton's... Third law here. Okay, so for example, a proton exerts five newtons on another proton, which then exerts an equal opposite force of five newtons on other protons. So for example, we'll, we'll call this proton A and this proton B. Well, proton A is exerting five newtons on proton B, so it's pushing it five newtons to the right because A wants it to go this way. It's applying a force this way. Meanwhile, B is applying a force in the opposite direction. So just like how we did last time, we draw the direction and the force acting on it. So this, this is actually, we call it, when we say it, we say this is B on A. And this here is A on B. And here, for example, we have our two opposite charges, a proton and a electron. So this applies this here. Um, the electron is pulling the proton to the right, four newtons, and the electron is then pulling the proton, sorry, the proton is pulling the electron to the left four newtons. So they're pulling each other closer to each other. Now, the magnitude of the force changes applied each other depends on the magnitude of the charge and the distance between them. The closer the charges are, the greater or bigger the force between them. And as they move farther apart, the force between them becomes weaker. So the equation for actually electric force it's given by, I'm going to write right here, F over E 
full electric equals some constant k, the charge of one charge, uh, the charge of the second charge, divided by the distance squared. So this implies two things, that one, the force is proportional to the charges, but then also the force is inversely proportional to distance squared. So, as the charges get bigger, the force between them gets bigger. But as they get further apart, then the charge becomes weaker. But if you bring them close together, then the charge gets greater. And although we didn't talk about it, this is actually very similar to the force of gravity, which is actually very interesting. Is you have some gravitational constant, G, the mass of one object, the mass of the second object divided by the distance squared. This is kind of like this really cool parallel thing about nature that these, the, the electric force between two electrical charges is almost identical in some ways of the gravitational force between two objects. Something interesting to think about. So let's talk a little bit about static electricity. Static electricity is the buildup of excess charge on an object. Excess meaning that it's no longer neutral. So this is what causes you to become shocked when you walk on the carpet and you touch the doorknob, for example. Right? So objects usually have, when you walk on the carpet, you start to walk. As you rub against the carpet, you gain some electrons from the carpet. Now you're negative. Then you touch the doorknob, and then you get shocked. And we'll talk more about that as we go on through this presentation. The electricity is, is the excess charge on an object. And that electricity is actually what causes lightning as well. So how do we generate charge? Well, there are three ways. Objects are generally neutral which means they have balanced charges. Balanced means they have the same number of protons as electrons. So the net charge is zero. So when you find the net charge is, you, you just add up the number of protons versus the number of neutrons. So I have four, I have, I have a positive four coulombs and a negative four coulombs. Well, positive four plus negative four is zero coulombs. So net charge is zero. That's what it means to be neutral, or balance. And those three ways that we charge an object is friction, conduction, and induction. And we'll go over more of these in depth, but the biggest one we want to talk about when we're talking about static electricity is friction, or rubbing things. So, a generating charge by friction. Two objects can become charged when rubbed together. Um, one object takes away some electrons from the second object, both now have more or less electrons than protons. This is what creates a charge. So, here's the thing. When we're rubbing objects and things from charge, the thing that changes is the number of electrons. And the reason that is, is because protons are actually in the nucleus of the atom, of the material itself, and it takes a lot of energy to pull them out of the nucleus. But electrons are on the outside, they're in the cloud, they're floating around, they're freely moving around, they have more space move around. So when you charge something, you're either adding or removing electrons. So certain objects have a greater affinity or attraction towards electrons. The object with the greater affinity takes electrons from the other, making itself negative and the other positive. So the more affinity you have, the more likely you want those electrons. So some objects are like, yeah, I'll take all the electrons I can get. Other objects are like, I can leave or take it. So we, we, usually happens is then the object that wants electrons more takes it from the object that doesn't want them as much. Making itself negative because now it has more electrons than protons and the other objects positive. Which brings me to when we talk later on about the conservation of charge. We'll talk more about that. So once again, just to reiterate, reiterate that negative objects have more electrons than protons. Positive objects have more protons than electrons. 
and neutral objects have the same number of electrons and protons. So once again, the stats are generating by friction. You take two objects, you rub them together. One object steals electrons from the second object. One becomes negative, one becomes positive. So this is a demonstration here. So for example, if I have a cloth here, and I'm rubbing it against this rib. So this has two protons, two electrons, four protons, four electrons. Well, both of these are, at this point, neutral. So here this is positive two, negative two, total of zero, positive four, negative four, total of zero. Okay, well when they rub, the rod steals an electron from the cloth. And so now this has one less electron. So this then is you have positive two, negative one, well that's equal to positive one coulombs. Positive four plus negative five is negative one coulombs. So now this, this has a net charge. This is positive and this is negative. And now these objects are charged. But notice the number of charges did not change. The number of protons and electrons of the system did not change. Here we had two protons, two electrons, four protons, four electrons, total of six protons and six electrons within the cloth rod system. Two protons, one electrons. Here, if you add them up, there's still the same number of protons and electrons. There's still six protons and six electrons. Where they are, this changed. One simply moved from the cloth to the rod. And this is the conservation of charge that the number of electrons and protons does not change. The protons and electrons are matter. And this comes, falls back into the conservation of matter. In fact, the conservation of charge is just the conservation of matter applied to electrical charges. So, just like energy cannot be created or destroyed, charge cannot be created or destroyed. Conservation of energy, the conservation of charge, the conservation of matter are all the same thing. Because matter is energy. Energy is matter. Matter is charge. They're all the same thing. So, charge cannot be created or destroyed. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. An example, like I said, with three electrons and three protons, you will end up with three electrons and three protons. Neutral object, charged objects. For example, I have on the right, I'm sorry, on the left here, I have four electrons, four protons, four electrons, four protons. But then I get some charge. This now has a net charge of plus one. This now has a net charge of negative one after rubbing them together. For example, they're still here. They're still, though, there's still eight electrons, eight protons. They did not change. That's the conservation of charge. Conduction is when an object is charged by being a charged object in contact with touching to a neutral object. The charged object then creates a charge by adding and moving electrons from the neutral object. So instead of rubbing now, we're simply moving things and touching them. So for example, I have this negative charged object. It gets brought to this neutral object here. This is a neutral object now. So this is negative, this is neutral. But this negative object touches this, transfers some of the electrons into the object. Now, they're both negative. This, it, this however, is less negative because it has less electrons. It gave some of the electrons to this object here. The total number of electrons did not change. Remember, conservation and charge. But it now both of them are negative because, remember, charge is the excess amount. Access meaning more of. Okay, however, electrons can be added to an object or removed. You can't add protons to an object. 
like I said, protons on the nucleus with the neutrons and they're very hard to remove. In fact, the number of protons and neutrons is what decides what material object is. That's the whole entire periodic table, is the number of protons and neutrons. Electrons can change, and then you get positive ions and negative ions, but what really determines the type of material, whether it's lead, or it's copper, or it's zinc, or it's helium, whatever material you want to think of, is the number of protons and neutrons. So if you were to change the number of protons, then suddenly your copper becomes lead, and that wouldn't make any sense. So now when we bring a positive object to a negative, a uh, neutral object, it actually steals electrons. Like I said, remember that, remember that I said that opposite charges attract? Well, the positive ob object is pulling the electrons. H here, it's pulling the electrons to it. It wants these electrons from this object. So now, this becomes a little less positive, but this becomes positive, because it has less electrons. So positive objects, when, it, when it's brought to a neutral object, and it charges the object, will attract some of the electrons and make it positive. Then charging by reduction occurs when an object, a charged object is brought near, but not touching a neutral object. The charge then separates, the charged object then separates the charges on the opposite object. So, once again, here, we're not changing the number of electrons or protons on the new object, but we're polarizing it, meaning that we're creating an electric field inside the object, because, like I said, before, Always remember this, that opposite charges attract. So protons want to be close to electrons. Electrons want to be close to protons. Electrons are supposed to be far away from each other as electrons, and protons want to be far away from other protons. So they kind of space themselves evenly about. But then here, you keeping a positive object, well, a positive object is going to pull the electrons. It's going to push the elect and the protons on the side. So what it's going to do, it's going to say, hey, electrons, come over here. You're attracted to me. Let's talk. Let's mingle. But, you know, you, you protons, get, get away from me. And then now you have a polarized object where you have one side is negative and one side is positive. It redistributes the positive and negative charges. So once again, that positive rod is saying, electrons, come mingle with me, I'm attracted to you, you're attracted to me, protons, please step away. And then, so, when we're talking about transferring charge, conductors is an object that easily allows the charge to flow or travel through it. So, example of conductors are copper, steel, aluminum, silver, this is why a lot of, of your wires are made of copper. It's a conductor, and copper is actually really cheap. I mean, these are just as good conductors, but these metals are more expensive to use. So we use copper for wiring. Because a lot of electrons move through it easily. Insulator, on the other hand, does not allow charge to flow or travel through it very easily. So glass does not allow electrons to move through it. Usually, wood doesn't and rubber doesn't. That's why you use rubber boots during, um, for example, a rubber gloves when you're dealing with electricity because you know that it's not going to travel through it. Electrons are extremely lazy. They choose the path of least resistance. So if, if they're going to choose between going through copper or through rubber, they're going to choose, they're going to choose copper. They're going to choose the metal. In fact, it's a common misconception that people think that, oh, you know, this is not be my best rendition of a car, so bear with me. People think that during lightning storm, this is all lightning, that what protects you is the rubber tires. That is incorrect. Rubber tires don't do anything for you when your car is struck by lightning. What actually helps you is the metal body. So electrons, instead of going through you, it's a lot easier to go through the metal. So it's going to go through the metal body because it doesn't want to go through you. 
because electrons are laser, they want to go through the easiest material. And then next week, we're going to talk about circuits, which are really fun. If you were in class right now, we would be building them, but unfortunately we're not. But, uh, but yeah, thank you for watching. We're going to do some example problems in the next video.